So I should tell you a little bit about the CCA first. Um, I can't get a good photograph of the CCA. So I've got this really stupid photograph of everyone in the cafe. The cafe is very important. It's a vegan cafe. Um, Glasgow is the vegan capital of the UK. Um, very surprisingly, because it used to be the heart attack of the capital of the UK. Ten years later, suddenly it's the healthiest place in the country. Um, and the cafe plays a very important role. Those really crappy lights you see at the top, they're very important. Clown lights or circus lights. Because they're so crappy, crappiness is really important to us because the building was remade in 2001 and it's very, very nice. And this is hugely problematical in a city like Glasgow. <laughs> it's just too nice for people to feel they belong. It's too posh. Um, so we spend most of our lives trying to make the space as crappy as possible because we want more people to come and feel relaxed. And so this has been, the lights are part of our strategy to be crappy. Um, we do get people, we get, we have a huge art community in Glasgow. There's maybe at least 500 people will come to openings and they're young artists, probably up to about 25. 25. Then the ones over age 25 don't come because they're embarrassed because they're over 25. Um, but there's just as many of them as well. So it's a vast art community. And CCA has traditionally had a role. It's a city that hasn't had a great art history. It's a city on the edge of nowhere, basically, with no art history. So people left it as soon as they graduated from the School of Art and went to London because London is where you could go and become successful. If you stayed in Glasgow, you just died. But you couldn't, and you still can't sell work. There is no commercial scene in Glasgow whatsoever. Um, so it's a city with no commercial scene. It's a city that everybody left until the 1970s. And in the 1970s, an art centre was founded called the Third Eye Centre by an ex-hippie, ex-heroin addict who came up to Glasgow to clean up and formed the Third Eye Centre with the help of his Indian guru um, and uh, opened a vegetarian restaurant, which was the first one in Glasgow, and set up a completely new kind of institution for Glasgow, the institution. But before that, there was nowhere to exhibit. Uh, you had to be, almost be dead or ready to die before you would get an exhibition somewhere, maybe in a national gallery, if you were lucky, in Edinburgh. Um, but you would never get to show anything in Glasgow. So there was absolutely nothing until this guy formed the Third Eye Centre. The Third Eye Centre was really interesting in its principles. It was very open, vastly influenced by Rotterdam. Um, there were a lot of hippie galleries in Rotterdam that were showing video, but also you could walk in, borrow a video camera, film what you wanted and bring the camera back. And the Third Eye was based on the principles of giving this all away. So they bought the first video camera in Scotland, made the first videos, and um, people could come in, borrow the camera and bring it back. And now we have a huge archive of these bizarre films from all across <laughs> Glasgow. It's anything was filmed, it was really fascinating to see. And at the time, there was the power strikes in the 1970s. So a lot of it was filmed by candlelight. So it's quite a peculiar history. There's also, it was the only place like this, counter-cultural place to speak 1970s. Um, so it was a place for art, but it was also a place where Marxists met or countercultural hippies met or feminists met, or if you were, were gay, you would go there. It was the only place in the city like this. So everything happened there and all of these roots remain, even though the city has blossomed and you know everything's got a network right across the city. <coughs> the original roots still, many of the original kind of issues are still based in the, even in the CCA 40 years later. People look to it as this bastion of, I don't know, some kind of anarchy. <laughs> There's, we were f funded by the Arts Council in Edinburgh. This is very important. But we're in Glasgow. Everyone in Glasgow hates Edinburgh. So <laughs> we were always outside of Glasgow because of this. Um, so we were allowed to do the things that Glasgow wasn't allowed to do. Um, even right up until the you know, very you know, last few years, we could show things that you couldn't show in Glasgow because we were not respectable. Um, didn't matter if we showed them because we were scum. 
this is a great advantage. <laughs> um, but it's a, we were able to show, at one point someone wanted to record the sound of people having sex in the Bergen, uh, in Berlin, in the nightclub, gay sex. That wasn't allowed anywhere in Glasgow. They wouldn't exhibit it, so they gave it to us. Um, there was another exhibit with an open Bible, which someone scrawled on the Bible, um, kind of something heretical. They sent us huge letters of complaint, even though we didn't show the work. All the letters came to us because everyone assumed it must be us who showed it. <laughs> so <laughs> even when we don't, we get we get the hassle. So there is this history of being able to do these things. Um, we also got a piece um, by a German photographer, which had a very low table with very sharp edges. And they said that could put out a child's eye, but they let us exhibit it because children in our space don't matter. So that was good. So there's this kind of funny, we, we exist in a non-space, so to speak, and we're constantly rendered invisible again and again. Um, and this is quite helpful in many ways. There was one moment where they gave a lot of money and they expanded the space and made it triple the size it had been before. And in a classic uh, funder's way, they gave us the money to do that, 10 million pounds, but they kept the program money the same to run the building. So the building had the same amount of money, but three times the space. Um, so 2001, it reopened. 2006, it went bankrupt uh, completely. Um, so it has had those histories. Um, I came in in 2006 by accident. I was there, I was working on a festival and the next show, the director had left mysteriously. And the next show was in the festival I was working on. So they asked me to look after the space while they advertised the post for director. And I put money in from the exhibition and found that the whole place had gone bankrupt. Hmm. So then my job became shutting the space. So I was given the job of shutting the space and they give money on a weekly basis to pay the, off all the debts and to begin to close the space, pay off all the debts and buy toilet rolls. That was the essential things. So that's what we did for the next year, weekly payments. And then we said, well, you can do what you want because it's all gone now anyway. So it's a beautiful space. It's absolutely the best space in Glasgow, I think. Um, and it, had, it has a cinema. It has a performance space, which can also be used as a cinema. It's got three exhibition spaces downstairs, another exhibition space on the third floor. Um, it's got hundreds of offices. It's got shops. It's got a restaurant cafe downstairs. And it's got another bar on the first floor. Um, so this is an amazing space. And we have every kind of equipment you could possibly imagine. Um, but they said, well, you need a business model, and this business model is you will rent it to artists. Artists have no money in Glasgow. I don't know if they have money anywhere else, but they have no money in Glasgow. So they were saying £600 a night to use the cinema, which if you get £600, you'd you know, buy a hitman or a house or something exciting. Um, so what we did was give the space away because the space was just going to sit there empty for that last year. So we thought, let's give people the space and they can do what they want, artists. So artists would apply to us and say, I'd like to do a film program, I'd like to do you know, performance, anything, and we would give them the space. And that began by word of mouth and began to escalate quite quickly. We looked at the offices, we had huge offices, maybe the size of this room, and there was only four or five of us left, and most people were crying in the corner because they were paying off the debts, they were afraid to answer the telephone. So we got rid of that and turned half the space we just built a wall across the space and said, this is now a residency space. Mm -hmm. and ma like magic, you just say it and it happens. We said, this is a residency space. There will be 12 residencies a year. And by magic, there were 12 residencies a year. Um, it was so easy to do. People started coming for free. We eventually, as years went on, got the money to actually fund that. Um, and the other spaces began to be used by people <coughs> to fill the space who desperately wanted to do things, but couldn't afford to it anywhere else in the city. So at that point, we were then on three monthly funding. Um, we only got properly funded two years ago. Um, <laughs> so this is a long story from 2006. Um, the funders said, OK, you can keep doing this. Um, so we began, it actually began to become a policy. And I've been studying digital uh, copyright and the whole notion of sharing. Um, particularly through a band called The Grateful Dead, the embarrassing bit of this. <laughs> but The Grateful Dead were a wonderful band who, terrible in the studio, but brilliant live. 
and they noticed people were taping their concerts illegally, badly. So they got their technicians who were brilliant to help set them up to tape them illegally with great precision. So the tapes began to circulate for free, all the tapes of the Grateful Dead. They're still online, archive.org. Thousands of tapes, every performance they ever had was taped illegally and circulated for free. They became the highest grossing band in the world by the mid-80s, <laughs> when they really shouldn't have been around. By giving away all of this, they built up such loyalty and such a following. Um, and that seemed a good example if we started giving the space away. And we realized then, only slowly did we realize as we did it what this meant. If we gave the space away, people began to feel they owned it, not us. Um, so they would come in and they were doing their program. We were marketing their program. Um, we had nothing to do with it, apart from sort of saying, here it is. Or if you needed a staff member, we'd give you a staff member at cost. Um, but otherwise, we keep out of it. We've already filtered and said, yes, this is, you're not a Nazi. Your program looks okay, um, which is about as close as that gets. It's not curatorially very strict. Um, so people began doing all of their own programs and getting their own credit for it. And the audiences got that immediately. No audience ever came in and went, I love the film program you did last week. They knew exactly whose film program it was and it wasn't ours. Um, we got the credit for not taking the credit, mm. if that makes sense. Mm. And they got that immediately as well. Audiences are very smart. <laughs> the funders took five years. <laughs> they said, this is crazy. Um, you're not filtering this. There's no system. It's a mess. How could you possibly do this? You know, nobody knows what's happening. Um, it's just terrible. The audiences knew exactly what was happening. You know, studied it and went to what they wanted to go and see. Um, the funders also said, well, you should mark, monetize each space. Get as much money as you possibly can for each space. Um, but there is no money in the city from the right people. We could sell the space, but only to people who don't do anything interesting. So the only way we could get interesting stuff happening was to give the space away. And anyway, it was better. Um, suddenly, people liked using the space. And so that model took off. So <coughs> now we have over 300 partners, I think, institutions, individuals, uh, art collectives, anyone um, who all use the space. In the <coughs> so that's about 90, maybe 95 percent of what we do is everybody else doing things, and we simply facilitate that and get out of the way. Um, and that brought huge audiences. We get, I think, uh, 340,000 people a year before the fire. We're up there with the zoo. If the, we had penguins, we would beat the zoo, but we don't have penguins. <laughs> we might get some penguins. <laughs> so, um, school children keep stealing the penguins in Edinburgh. It's great. So, but that put us in a different league entirely. We're one of the top 10 venues, and you know, this was unheard of. Yet, it's all done without any money exchanging. Um, so we get money, but now we get money to fund that. So we're facilitating all of that. And we do a core program linked to visual art as well and the residences. That's the only bit we have kept to ourselves is the core program of visual art and the residencies. Everything else, including the top gallery, uh, top galleries open submission. The residencies are open submission and there are panels who select for those. So we've kind of stripped away the curatorial authority and that's not ideal for everywhere. So I'm not recommending that's the way forward, but it's, for a building that size, it was it was just too much ego <laughs> for a building that size. You'd need to be a monster <laughs> to have the ego to fill each one of those spaces and say, this is my program. So it, that was insensible. And I say people got that and understood. And the need in Glasgow was for many artists who are very much do it yourself within Glasgow, with no money, with no commercial scene, to be able to do these things in the space. So it worked really well in that context that Glasgow needed a space where money wasn't the obstacle and it was a good platform. And the platform was central enough that people would take notice of it. Even if you were an artist just out of college and nobody knew who you were. If you did an exhibition upstairs, it was a CCA exhibition. And that gained a kind of kudos that you, know, you might have to wait five years or 10 years in London to get it just because it's so small and so much attention placed on it. So that was, that was the strategy and that's how it's continued. Um, it's grown, see, uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> fire. Wow. There was a fire. Two fires. This was the second fire. The first fire was devastating. The most beautiful library, Macintosh Library in the School of Art, and that whole wing was burnt to the ground. Um, there was a determination to rebuild it. They rebuilt it. They were three months from opening it. And then this fire happened, and this fire is just so much bigger. Oh. Uh, so, mm. I cannot express how much bigger this fire was. Um, that's, that's, you can't actually see it anymore. That's what it looked like. That was the scaffolding from the first fire, which had fused to the walls of the building after the second fire. And that had to be stripped off. And now it just looks like a giant porcupine. There's three levels of scaffolding on each wall outside. That just looks like a giant porcupine in the middle of the thing. Um, so that's all that's left. There's no f no walls left inside. There's no floors left inside. Everything is gone. So um, that that's much more severe. Um, and that probably has raised questions that no one has dared to address within the time. There's been a lot of a lot of anger as well as trauma for this, especially the second one. The first one is kind of like sad. sad. Second one is kind of like how could this happen? Sad. How did it happen? Did someone burn it down? It's just so severe. So that whole trauma is happening, but at the same time, the school of art has remembering there's a camera kind of internally imploded. The morale is really low. Um, there's just you know a sense of what are we doing? How are we doing this? What what is the future of the art school? And in fact, I'm I'm quite optimistic about that. I think this building is gone. I would happily forget this building. <laughs> I have no loyalty to the building after being burnt down twice. Um, but the art school is not about a building. The art school is about you. Know, well, we never got to teach in it anyway. I teach on the MFA one day a week. Um, I kept my jobs because I wasn't sure the CCA would work. So we were always teaching these crappy buildings, you know, old children's schools that were converted or whatever. We never taught in that building. So the teaching was fine without the building. So I think if the teaching is fine and the relationship with the students is good, if you really think the building's that important, you're wrong. You're, you're missing something. So um, I know it's <laughs> architectural tragedy and all, <laughs> but um, we have very, I've got very little time for it. And also I've got very little time for it because it led to us being shut for five months. Not only that, the whole street beside it um, was shut for three months and the, the tenants were evacuated for three months. Um, one woman was evacuated, she was three months pregnant. She lost her business, she lost her house. And for the next three months had to live in a different room every night. She would live in a room in kind of sheltered housing. She'd have to ring up, she'd leave, go to the telephone, ring up and come back and get another house for the next night. And that was kind of how all of those tenants were living. So there was a huge anger among all of the tenants. All of the businesses were shut up. In the main street in Scotland, all of the businesses were closed. The entire street was um, gone. Uh, to take that out just because it's so sad. Yeah. Um, but that's what it looks like kind of afterwards. Um, we're, we're that building where it says Sucky Hall Street. And mania, ironically. <laughs> Bagel mania, not <laughs> the hard mania. Um, uh, and that's what the street looked like for most of the next year. It's only improved in the last few months um, and got better. Um, but that's what it was like, um, and that's what it was like just outside our mm. front door for the three months as well. It was great. It was like one thing would follow another, like the apocalypse. They had giant cranes to hold up the building, but when the giant cranes moved, they discovered that the cranes had smashed all the water pipes below oh. but kept the water from coming out because of the weight. So when they moved, <laughs> um, the entire street flooded. The building beside us is packed with rats because there's another venue that also went on fire, the ABC, and beautiful venue for concerts. And no one can get into it because it's so delicate. So it's also uh, now full of rats because no one can get in to do anything with it. Um, so that's kind of <laughs> where we were left. Um, that, was, that was traumatic in its own way, plus all those people that we were working with, they imagine 1,200 events a year, you lose four months. 
Um, people said around the city, it's very useful in one sense for us, it's like advertising. The city council said, we'll take on those events, we'll support them. And then we gave them the events and they went, but no one's paying anything. We can't take these events, they have to pay us. And they didn't understand until that point that we had been giving these people space for free and they wouldn't, couldn't. So all of the events had to wait for us to reopen um, because the city, this monetary system, we were totally out of it and they didn't grasp that until the fire. So now they grasp that, um, but it also proved to us that no one else is working in this way. This is quite unique. So all of those people that we're working with, many of the major festivals, 26 festivals in the city are all kind of reliant on us offering this space for free. So that was a real revelation. Um, and we then had to wait and see what would happen. Um, so we eventually, well, the police then didn't help in that the police declared we were shut indefinitely, um, which was a big mistake, because that meant to everyone who listened to the radio, we were shut forever. That was what everyone took from it. So our funders stopped funding us. Mm. <laughs> the city, <laughs> who actually run the police, stopped funding us. They said, well, you're not open anymore. I, was like, I know there's been a fire. <laughs> And they were going, well, we can't give you any money, you're not, we can't fund you, you're, you're gone now. So everyone decided we were gone, and this has not improved totally yet. I put in an application this morning for funding. I had to ring the funders before that to say, by the way, we are actually open. We exist, we're open, we're properly funded. Here's our accounts, we are doing well. But they don't know, because they're too far there in London. So they just, you hear the bad news, but the bad news takes like 10 years. Mm -hmm. To overcome the good news different bad news you're shut and you're gone you're gone forever so we're ringing people one by one to say we are actually open we exist we're doing things and then they say can you send us accounts can you prove this it's really remarkable i've gone to major meetings even in the city i went to one recently and there were, everyone was really nice to me and at the end the guy leading the dinner said um, so what's it like you're not having a space to work in anymore and being closed I was like, <laughs> we've been open since November. This was June. <laughs> so this, these are key decision makers. Um, it just doesn't get through. Went to the cultural strategy department. And again, they went, what, what do you do? Where are you? <laughs> it's like, so we've completely fallen off the map. Again, yet again, for the third or fourth time. And this, each time, I think you mentioned this, one of the shadow kind of things, each time is a kind of opportunity because there are a lot of things we want to do and it's hard to do them when you're officially there and everything is fixed. So one of the things uh, you were talking about was basically diversity. And diversity is really hard because employment law, you can't decide we're gonna have a diverse organization, I'm gonna get rid of this half of the organization and replace everyone. That's, you know, so you have to wait for everyone to die or move on or something. And with the economy at the moment, it's very, very slow movement. And so you're trying to do this and then you put out a job advert and no one replies who isn't kind of, you know, white and Scottish because they're the only people who've been trained and they're the only people who feel they would be welcome to apply. So I'm going way off my script here, but it kind of leads to a point where you realise there's a bigger problem with that, which is education. So the education in Scotland, you don't really get much of an art education in many schools and there's schemes to bring you to see businesses that you might want to work with later. So you get to go and meet Scottish Gas, you get to go and meet insurance companies, you get to go and meet kind of banks. Um, but there's only one, which is us, at this point, one arts organisation you could maybe visit to find out what happens in art. And that's 350 organisations offering this opportunity to mentor people. There's only one that actually will mentor, we, we can mentor one person mm. per year. So it's really slow. Um, but nobody else mentions art or mentions the kind of jobs you might get in art. Because you know, as you know, if you run an institution or if you're an artist sort of looking at an institution, there's, there are artist jobs, there's curator jobs, but there's also finance jobs, admin jobs, cleaning jobs, bar jobs. There's, you know, we have 127 people altogether working throughout the building in different ways. Um, but they don't even know we exist, never mind that you could get a job there or that they might like to do something in the arts because the schools won't tell them. And actually the rich schools are worst because the rich schools want you to study accountancy, law, 
etc. They do not want their children to think about art. Or can I come home one day and go, I've got to the CCA. <laughs> I know what I want to do. <laughs> then you have to kind of you know, stream at them for six years, get them to not do that. So this is a problem. So we're trying to insert ourselves into the education system in different ways to actually bring more school kids. And actually the people we're working with on this mentor scheme have been brilliant. They've started planting all the children for their initial meetings in the CCA. So even if they're not with us, they're walking through it thinking, what the hell is this? Mm. And that is a huge advance already that they see this thing that they might want. And only a fraction of them might want it. But it's that fraction that are, you know, lonely, dispossessed and angry and weird and kind of would like to come to the CCA. Yeah. But there are people. <laughs> so that's kind of how we're trying to get to the educational side first. But also trying to get to the educational side where we might get to different communities who wouldn't have thought this was a possibility and to start working with them and get them in as well. So one of the things we're using is that open source program I mentioned where we give anyone the space to use. But we've actively started going out to those different communities. There's Glasgow's much behind the rest of Europe. <coughs> Ten years ago, Glasgow was, um, to be really blunt, a very white city, almost very little diversity historical emigration in the 60s for Asian and Chinese populations, which have been very much integrated since. But since then, there's been a huge African migration, huge Syrian migration, a huge Roma migration, huge Polish migration. You know, there's huge waves of Pol uh, coming to Glasgow because Glasgow is called the largest dispersal area outside of London, which means everyone that comes into England gets sent to Glasgow get the nice food and food, and stay alive longer. <laughs> so this is this has mean that in the last 10 years, the city has changed radically. Um, and that that's really important because there are a whole new set of demographics in the city. And it's also they're sent to Glasgow because the audience in Glasgow is aging rapidly. I think Glasgow had the lowest birth rate ever in its history this year, something like 0.2%. Probably a child and a half has been born in Glasgow this year. So it's kind of, nobody's been born. So it's vital to the economy of Scotland as well. And Scotland, unlike England, has been very welcoming. Um, from the outside, I guess, England doesn't look very welcoming at all. But Scotland has had this progressive wave of politics um, that has included migration as uh, one of the best things that's happening to the country. And there's a program called New Scots, um, which is promoting this as well. So from my perspective, I can, I can sense that, but I can also sense what is the point of us in the wave, in, you know, uh, in this wave? Where do we stand or where will we stand in five years' time, ten years' time? How do we offer something or what would we offer? What would people want? So we use the open source program and go to the different communities. Um, again, we use food, which is where the shadowing comes in. Um, but differently, we go to the communities and ask them to, f to cook food. Uh, we uh, facilitate them doing food events uh, throughout the city where they invite people from other communities to come and taste their food and to work together through that. So in that sense, we're doing the open source side of this and that we don't want to interfere because who are we? What would I know to go to a Syrian family and say, would you like to cook food <laughs> for that family over there from China? It's like, you know, who are you? Why can I go away? So it's kind of, we facilitate it, but we, we get out of it as well and we try to hand over the control of that, the autonomy for that, to those different communities um, and to do it in their way. So that is one of the things we're doing with food. That also came from an older program, which was we've done a lot of growing and a lot of vegetable cooking since. Ironically, I don't like vegetables, but um, because the mortality rate for men in Glasgow, for instance, has been 50 to 55 in a lot of areas that's the reality um, and that's pretty low that's you know, kind of so there's a whole swathes of Glasgow you don't see and that's the they don't see vegetables they don't see fruit um, when they do they don't know what to do with them so we've had classes teaching people what a potato is or how you would deal with a fish because they don't know how to do it if it's not in the tin they, you know that and you can't get it if it's not in the tin in those areas that they're living in there's no supermarket food distribution. So that has been a foundation for the cooking pot programs that we're doing as well. 
which is much wider um, kind of spectrum. Um, but that has been something that has been a start. And from there, we're also sort of saying in those communities, you could come to CCA and use it. And so they've started to come to CCA. And that, that sounds wonderful. I said that they started coming to CCA. It's also wonderful. We're also cool. They've come to CCA and stood outside the door. So we invited the African community to come for a big project. And they came. Well, actually, the first time they didn't come. First time they went to a minibus. And they all talked at the minibus for an hour. And they went back to their flats. And totally understandable when you stand in those flats and you look at the city centre. There's no way you would go to the city centre. You're, you don't have the money. You, you, you're not dressed. You know you wouldn't be welcome anyway. Um, really difficult to overcome that. So the second time we got people further, but they only went to the front door. And we had to go out and then bring them in physically and sort of say, you're welcome. And that, you know, had to keep doing that. And that has had to keep happening before kind of getting to break that down. It's, and that's partly all sorts of other reasons, but also partly we look so posh. But on top of all the social reasons as well, we just look too grand to come into it, which is tragic because <laughs> we have no money. <laughs> but that's how it looks. So that's kind of what we're doing with that. And it's really slow and it's really crude um, in a way as well. But it's begun to work. So if I take the trajectory of the Roma, for instance, is our most successful so far that they began to come, their children began to come for projects, uh, music projects. And so the parents had to come to watch the children do the music projects. And then the parents began to feel no one attacked them while they were there. This wasn't just as bad as it might have been. And so gradually they began to feel some confidence. And then gradually they said, could we use the space? And they started doing some music events of their own. And then through those music events, they then asked, could they do a program throughout the year of a kind of almost like a music gypsy Kaylee every month. And that's been successful. So on the back of that, they said, could we get an office in CCA? So now they have their own office in CCA. And that was a major explicit thing for them to do because they were thinking of just getting somewhere in a community hall to meet. But they realized if they got somewhere with us, because we look so posh, <laughs> we look mainstream. So there's a kind of, they can use our cachet as looking mainstream uh, to place themselves right at the kind of heart of the Scottish or Glasgow community and gives them a kind of respectability just by, just through the address almost. So there's, and that was very mutually explicit. Um, and we talked about that before we did it. And so they now have an office in the space. I should have said there's 20 offices in the space apart from us and they all get reduced rents. <coughs> There's also a shop, two shops, design shop, bookshop. We support them. They don't give us any money, but we pay for them because if there's a shop, you look normal. People might come in, <laughs> they see a bookshop or they see jewelry and they go, I could come in and buy some jewelry and they, you know, they say, oh, coffee, you know, scones, you know, so you get past a vegan scones, you know, eventually there's some art, but we don't push that at anyone. It's like selling heroin. You kind of do it slowly, gently, <laughs> work them up towards it. So that's kind of what we've been doing with that. But that means there is that trajectory and more of the community are beginning to follow that trajectory. Um, and at the same time as following that trajectory, that's led to a kind of more general interest from those communities in our structure. So now the board has changed radically as well. So the board, I would say, is um, really young and really diverse. Um, it's kind of shocking, um, <laughs> but it's very unlike any of the other boards in Scotland at the moment. It's um, changed radically, and it's not the usual suspects. They're not necessarily from the art world in a kind of more classical sense. They're from a wider world. So when you're saying about the popular world, it's the same. But what are we talking about now when we're talking about, that's why Cultural Centre is good, because you know, the 16-year-olds we're inviting in are all listening to Korean pop. And they're all class regions from the east end of Glasgow, but they're they're not listening to anything else. They don't want, they don't have that kind of boundary anymore. So it's yeah, it's very different in terms of what do we, what are we going to present becomes the challenge. What should change the board? And we're beginning to change the kind of the, the team through natural wastage. 
is a good way to put it. But um, each each time someone leaves, it's an opportunity to think how could we approach this post differently and restructure the management. So the management is changing constantly as we restructure the management and advertise the jobs towards communities. So now we've had a, a really good curator and she's done a brilliant program and she's moving on and she's become a director of a place in Sky, Ainsley Roddick. So that's she did, wonderful. She did a great program. It's sad that she's leaving. And on the other side, there's an opportunity. And the opportunity, weirdly, is to not fill her post. Um, so she's kind of what the, the key curator in the, the middle of the program. But by not filling her post, thinking that could be a good opportunity to start doing fellowships for people from the different communities to give them the experience to program and to learn how to program so that when the next jobs do come up, we will get a much wider variety of people applying for the jobs, knowing what the jobs entail, going elsewhere with our references as well, but beginning to actually, through the educational side of it, make a change in terms of who is around doing things also providing money then for them to go to the communities that they're coming from to do programming with them either in the communities or in CCA or both so to move across like that um, but to give them the autonomy again to do that rather than us going to a community and deciding we would know because we don't know um, but also building up their uh, resilience in a sense to do that themselves and to also change the CCA become a place for that to happen um, and when we're under the radar who cares no <laughs> we don't exist so if we don't exist we don't have exhibitions we don't have exhibitions no one can criticize our exhibition because we don't exist so that's a wonderful opportunity to just move ahead and make the changes um, but it's almost like we can do that because we face disasters again and again the other organizations that don't face disasters find it much more difficult to make the changes because they're fixed into a system that you know keeps going as it's meant to keep going and again until everybody else dies they're faced with that situation so yeah i think the disasters have been really helpful for us um and also i think it's left us with a sort of none of us care that much if the whole place was just shut tomorrow you know it's, it's happened so often but also there's no loyalty to keeping this why does it have to exist forever it doesn't so if it's no use it can go if it's of use maybe someone should fund it which also gets us to public funding because we're primarily publicly funded if people don't want to public i don't believe the things people say that well funding funding is decreasing but i don't believe the reasons people say why funding is decreasing it doesn't seem to be decreasing for the nuclear fleet a few miles from glasgow the British nuclear fleet is just down the river. You know, funding still seems okay there. Magically, they're not making cutbacks. They're not selling off missiles on eBay. You know, they're they're quite happily, you know, rearming. Um, so, and I don't believe the schools and you know health argument either, because we're not point not not two percent of the annual budget for the entire country. If you raised everyone to a survivable level, it would be like no. Or it would be ridiculously small. So the, the reasons are political, they're not financial. I have no confidence in it being financial whatsoever. I think it's more it's ideological and it's political. And it's a desire to stop having these public places for public forum kind of opportunities for people to be able to discuss things without Red Bull funding it and saying you can't fund it. You, it's a sort of space that's vanishing everywhere, I think, across Europe. Has valid, you know, places like South Africa have that kind of public space, but a space where you can actually have those debates and arguments and say, say the unspeakable things that you're not meant to say, that is not welcome. And I think so. I don't think we should, I think we should fight it <laughs> um, actively rather than sort of accept it or kind of try and find ways around it. I think we should also advo you know, advocate, too, too nice a word, but kind of more radically tell people where to shove it because the spaces are needed and people know the spaces are needed. If we're in the top 10 venues in Scotland, people must, they're smart. Um, but the reduction in funding has nothing to do with that. So I don't believe that. So I'm kind of quite aggressive on that. We have to argue for that. Also, that's why we exist. We exist to have ideas and opinions 
and to lead and to do these things and to sort of come up with alternative ideas. So if we just sit and wait until we're killed with a thousand cuts, and that's, we may as well fight it out. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> uh, just to go there and sit. Well, we're all going to die anyway, so yeah. <laughs> it makes no difference. Um, but yeah, but that I think it does make a difference. I don't think we are all going to die. Most of us will die. Um, I've been reading Bruno Latour, that book. It's a good book. I think it's called Down to Earth. Um, but it's very much laying out the fact, for instance. He lays out a very, very clear, rational argument that it's not that there are climate deniers who don't understand what's happening. There are climate deniers who know exactly what's happening. So Donald Trump and you know, Johnson and everybody else who's a climate denier, all the corporations, they know exactly, they've known for 40 years, maybe 50 years, what they're doing. What they're doing is putting forward a fog of denial and obfuscations so that they can make as much money as possible before they can't make money anymore and before it becomes so extreme that they have to stop and get out of coal and fossil fuel. So they know that exactly. They're not stupid in any way. Uh, they're very cynically milking the last you know, billions and billions and billions from this before they have to stop and buying bits of New Zealand to go and live in when this happens, um, which it will happen. Um, and it's already happening. And you can see it up here more than you can see it even in Glasgow. So in Glasgow you can see it as well. Just the things that are disappearing, the plants, the animals. The animals that are appearing, which is even worse. The animals from the Mediterranean that are now outside Glasgow knocking on the door. That's fascinating. Um, but when you get up to the top of Norway and you get up to the Arctic Circle, you begin, you know, week by week. I think I gave this talk in Gothenburg last year, some form. And already everything I said like this is just um, out of date. Like you all know that the whole earth is burning up and you can see that we're heading to 50 degrees every year, more and more. So more of those parts of the world are becoming uninhabitable. So the implications, I think, more generally for Europe are that, and this is what um, uh, thingy Bruno Latour puts forward, is that we have a very stable form of life in especially Northern Europe. Everything is wonderful. There are banks, there are schools, there are cinemas. People, you know, quite often have nice houses with little gardens and pets and they watch TV and, you know, then they die. It's lovely. Um, and that is kind of what we're fighting for at the moment because the waves of all of the people are going to have to leave all of those parts of the community. We're in the golden age of migration right now. When it's a tiny drop of migration and people are going, this is terrible. Once the real migration starts, the climate migration, en masse, I think that's what people are preparing for with, with walls, with Brexit, you know, all of these things are, how can we keep enough people out because we can see them coming en masse. And it's not about now, it's about 10 years from now. That's what they're preparing for now. And they're getting everybody ready. And they're, they're preparing everyone slowly to kind of go, yes, well, of course you've got to separate the children. Of course you've got to treat them really badly. Some of them might die, you know. That kind of, that's becoming more and more prominent. But that's just preparation for the future. So once that happens, that kind of way of life that kind of is very stable in the north of Europe is already really an illusion. It's already shaky. And it's only surviving because of these kind of right-wing things that are happening to protect it. Um, there's this odd complicity in a funny way that we're all complicit because these, you know, lunatics are actually, you know, keeping a sort of form of life alive that really doesn't deserve to be alive, which is ours. <laughs> so that can't happen and continue to happen. And the, the stability that it's here is an illusion and that stability will not last. So that stability will turn into a constant set of of catastrophes, a constant set of crises, a constant set of imbalances that people are going to have to deal with. I did warn you this would get <laughs> depressing, but I think that's what's coming and that's what Latour is arguing is coming as well. That we have to live with a set of choices that we can keep that stability at a very high cost. And that high cost is pretty much shooting people over the wall. That's the kind of cost that we're beginning to talk about. 
um, or we begin to move into an entirely different form of life, um, an organization and society, um, which isn't just art centers, but it's you know everything about society. Uh, you know, how do we travel? How do we eat? Um, actually, vegans are very much at the forefront of the danger in Scotland because there's no vegetables in Scotland. Hmm. So they're all coming from elsewhere. We get all the worst of your vegetables. Um, they come last to Scotland, but at least they're better than the ones we have. Once they stop coming or we can't afford them, which will probably be November, um, then all the vegans will die in Scotland. So, you know, <laughs> it's a, there is a kind of food thing. Who really is producing their own food? and who will be able to produce food and what food can you produce when the climate has changed sufficiently and um, who will have water and who won't have water that's not clear yet either um, people can't figure out where the water is going to go there is a water war between Scotland and England at the moment Scotland has loads of water England has a permanent drought so apart from independence or Brexit or anything England needs Scotland because it desperately needs the water but no one ever talks about that well, there's a water war going on, water crisis. The Syrians are coming because there's a water war. That's a lot of what that's about is water as well. Um, the people from Ecuador who are moving through Mexico up to the border, that's because the farms have dried up. There's, they can't farm there anymore, so they have to leave and they have to come north. Um, so those, those things are already underway and just beginning to accelerate. Um, so a lot of those governments that are out there kind of going stupidly or whatever, they know exactly what's happening, but they're not going to deal with that. And we, we have to change everything in order to survive that, to find new adaptable, resilient ways to grow food, um, to live, to educate, all of those things. And then within that, what is, <laughs> skipping quickly through the disaster, what does an art centre do? <laughs> that's, that's the next question. So what, what would be the point of an art centre? And for an artist, the question would be, what kind of art could you make that people would want? Um, that's another good question. Um, but at the moment, that's not really been discussed much in art schools. So artists are still producing the same stuff and coming out and the art centers are showing it. But actually, that's you know, uh, <coughs> a time limited activity. So. What would you produce as an artist for the future that would be useful? We don't need to be kind of hit too much with disaster because we already know that. So what, what would you give people or what would you do or why would you do it? And where would you show it? And how would you show it? And do you need to show it? And why would we exist? Um, so all of those questions come into the notion of an art centre, um, a cultural centre. What, what would our role be at that point? Um, so I think that comes up with us even working with you know, asylum seekers and refugees now. Is that's a start, but where is this where is this leading and how much can we do? How much should we do? You know, what would be the most useful thing for us to do? What would possibly be uplifting but also educational or you know, demonstrate resilience or I like the elasticity and I like this notion of improvisation. I think the best thing we can do is improvise dance. I think we teach everyone how to improvise. <laughs> Improvisation is the future. Um, if you can have a mind that can improvise, then you really have resilience, then you really have elasticity. You know, it doesn't matter if your grant is this or if your grant is zero, you, you improvise and you work around. So workarounds and improvisation, I think, are the key things you could pass on to people or actually put at the center of your program, I think for me. Am I, what do we do? <coughs> Uh, so that's kind of where I'm thinking we should go. I don't know how we get there. Um, we also, that notion of the open source has led us back. I was interested in sort of this in Kieran because I was thinking about we're at the same point thinking, what do we do with exhibitions in the short term? And we're thinking, should we keep doing exhibitions in the classical form of the exhibition? Or should we open that up as well? And what would happen if we open that up? And we don't know. One reason we still have classical exhibitions, we don't know how not to have classical exhibitions. <laughs> if, if we say, well, we won't, or we did try this summer, we said we'll have a continuous summer. It's just like, Neh. and people come in and do stuff, and then they leave, and other people come in and do stuff, and the audience remains, but they're active as well. What would that look like? And we, we didn't succeed. We did a lot of really good exhibitions, but they all turned out to be exhibition, 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 exhibition. And artists want, ex you know, Go to an artist, they want an exhibition. 
Så nej. Det är en av de här. So and also, you know, artists have been trained in colleges to come out and get an exhibition. So what would you do if you're an artist and you don't get an exhibition? But we did do one show which is called, called The House That Heals the Soul, which was about books. And we put many small libraries of books by different artists and different organizations that produced artist books in the space. And we did huge tables as well, and flowers, and um, secret kind of um, things that you could take and uh, download as many books as you wanted. Um, all of those things went into the same space. Sofas, people would come in every day and just lie on the sofa, read newspaper, spend hours, and then maybe read a book and do whatever. But people started inhabiting the space in different ways. And we had made a workshop space and people started organizing their own workshops um, in the space as well for other people, which has gained almost nothing to do with us. Um, and this felt much more active as an audience, that they weren't watching a show um they were just there was art there but they were also actively doing stuff and it might have been about art it might not have been about art but they were doing it in a space that held some art and um we've been trying to figure that out ever since it was one of our most successful shows and we didn't know why and we weren't expecting that so we're trying to figure out well, what does what does that mean in terms of how could you change the dynamic between the audience as agents within the show and doing their own thing as well as artists and as well as the organization and so that but going back i guess if you bought a vermeer in the old days 16th century 17th century whatever you probably took it home and stuck it over the sofa if they had sofas and you watched it for 50 years but you didn't the, the way people interacted with art has been different at different times in history you know people still buy art and stick it in their house and live with it every day and eat their breakfast beside it they don't just stand and watch it reverently in a kind of art world way. So there are different ways to actually experience art that can be maybe more enriching than going in and seeing something for five minutes. There was a show I went to last year and there was a whole series of 17th century works in Scotland from the golden period and whatever. And I saw this beautiful work, but I just didn't know what to do with it. I was kind of looking at it and thinking, oh, have I given it enough time? How, how much time do you give a work like this? Is there a time limit? You know, did I feel anything? Uh, you know, if I give it another 10 minutes, will I explode you know, with something? Ecstasy, you know, and I just didn't know what to get from this work or how long to give it. And there was a Poussin beside it. You know, and then there was another Poussin next to that. You know, it was like, what am I meant to do here? I, didn't, I don't know how to look properly at a work for a long time. And I don't know what I would get from that to some extent. I don't know, it would be lovely to know if anyone has had an ecstatic experience recently in a gallery. <laughs> I need the education. But it's trying to think what what do you get from that? How would that work? And what are you looking at? You're looking at paintings from different periods as well. Like, you know, um, and is, are you meant to get educated? Does it have to be that difficult? That you have to get a special education to look at the damn thing. You know, um, that's fascinating, but I don't know if I don't know how to look. Maybe I shouldn't be at this job. But also, <laughs> but also I'm not meeting a lot of other people that know how to look. You know, and sometimes the classic, you go in, you see the exhibition by the artist, and it just feels like the artist's authority. You know, you bow before it, you look at the work, and then you leave. And that just feels incredibly passive. And not, and I think for younger audiences, maybe very passive. And they're just like, what is this shit? You know, like, I, I want to be more involved. I want to be active. You know, so there must be a greater relationship that could be had. Um, so I don't know. I'm kind of interested in that as well. I've gone way off the subject. <laughs> Didn't tell you about half the thing. We have a publication studio. We have a we have a room. We don't know what it is. Uh, it's called the Electron Club. And <laughs> It's totally autonomous and people can join it and they do stuff and you have to ask them, can you join it? And then you do stuff, but we don't know who they are. And we, it's been there for 12 years now. But I went in one day and someone was making a synthesizer. I went in another day at the Red Cross with her, working with uh, African women to improve their confidence in society. Went in another day, there was a knitting class. Another day, there was a coding class for women. It's kind of like, but we have nothing to do with that. 
and they just look after themselves quite happily for the last 12 years. Um, and so no one ever talks about that space. The board never talks about it. I don't talk about it in case they notice it's there. Um, and it's been thriving without us, which is kind of, I don't know if that's good or bad. Maybe it's a reprimand. Um, but they've been thriving totally without us, and it's a really active space in its own right. So there's that. Uh, we have a publication studio as well because we can't afford to publish books. We just don't have the money, but we like books. So we have a perfect binder where you can bind books and make your own books and either sell them or give them away. And that's really popular, and that's a consortium of people from around the city. And everyone comes in and makes their own books. So yeah, that's kind of popular. Should I stop? Yeah. I think I should stop. Mm -hmm. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious, have you ever gotten anything that you felt like, okay, this actually, we, we can't, you know, have these people doing this here, whatever. I mean, you yes. sound extremely generous and it's super interesting, but There's has there been anything that you was like, oh, this won't work? one a year. Um, we had something recently that looked like it was going to be political and was actually going to turn into a political party. And we said we'd only allow that if we could charge them. Because we don't mind it being a political party, but we're not going to give it to them for free. Because we don't want to support any political party. Um, we had one which this group of artists were actually uh, setting traps for pedophiles online by pretending to be young children and allowing themselves to be groomed till they got to the point where they would report the people to the police. And they wanted free space and they felt that was just on the borderline. It was entrapment, maybe. And we didn't feel comfortable with that. Um, yeah, we had a few other things that were a bit too Nazi, but they were just obviously Nazi, stupid. Um, but no, there's, within that, yeah, someone who did something that we thought was too mainstream <laughs> <laughs> they just wanted to show movie movies but with no context or irony or anything just like we want to show kind of harry potter movies kind of like no go away we don't show theater much because theaters if they come to us must be bad because there are many good theaters uh so and we're not equipped and it leaves an awful lot of rehearsal time that leaves the space shut and we don't most spaces are occupied every day in the CCA, so we tell theatre people to go away. I actually have one question more. <laughs> Do you get your energy from like being an underdog? Or Because yeah. it's like, uh, I think find that interesting because yeah. it feels like also you have a very sort of, if you go up to, uh, in Swedish you say like helicopter perspective, mm. uh, and you think about, okay, uh, actually the world, we will die and the yeah. world will terminate, then everything on a daily basis scale yeah. in one way isn't all that important yeah. but uh, how do you sort of renew your energy in one way it's partly partly through catastrophe <laughs> <laughs> one accident after another mm. but it always leaves us in a kind of position of um, nobody ever quite loves us enough mm. which is brilliant because you can just get on with doing stuff and you, you don't have that expectation of being right and in the art world we're not right either mm. i don't think we have a I don't know where we stand in the art world, but we're kind of inside, outside, but it doesn't really matter. We're too far away. So that, it does give you a huge sense of freedom. Mm. And personally, I enjoy the freedom, but maybe other people wouldn't and want, I know other people would want to make it much more established and would close a lot of it down and make it, you know, a model of good practice. Mm. And we aren't a model of good practice. So there's that. But there's this Zapatista thing. We are already dead. <laughs> It's one of my favorite models, mm -hmm. but then you can get on with things because you're already dead. So <laughs> I quite like that. Yeah. Uh, Rosa Zapatista support in Glasgow. God knows why. <laughs> so yeah, it's a funny <coughs> time. It's a very political time in that way. So the Chilean thing last night was very interesting to see because we have the equivalents. We have an archive as well. I forgot to mention that. Very nice archives, got little boxes and stuff. Uh, that's been useful. The archive, we couldn't remember what we did because everyone else is so young in the organization. They're only there for a few years and they leave. 
and you say something like, oh, you know, they go, you should really work with this person. You go, we've worked with them three times. <laughs> and they don't know because it's beyond 2016 now. It's like, I wasn't born. You know, that's kind of how they go. They were like too young. So, you know, that is useful to sort of say. The opening program in 73 was Miles Davis, Duke Ellington, Mahavishnu Orchestra, and Allen Ginsberg. And mm. That's really hard for people to believe, mm. um, even me. But we can't prove it. So, mm. that's good. Wow. We have this great guy came as well. Uh, he's in the archive, Julius Eastman. Nobody knows who he is. He um, and he was mislabeled. His video was mislabeled for forty years as uh, Martin Feldman. Martin Feldman being kind of <laughs> middle-aged and kind of heavy and you know Jewish, and uh, Julius Eastman being young, slender, black, gay, uh, in New York, but been taught by Julius uh, Martin Feldman, and he wrote really radical things. Uh, he was very angry, so he wrote things like "Gay Gorilla," um, and um, no one gave him a proper job because he was too angry. I think. And black, yeah, 1978. So in the end, he became homeless and he became uh, an addict. And You're talking about the music composer? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So he all his work was dispersed by debt collectors, disappeared. But he performed one concert in Glasgow in 1974, which was taped by these lunatics with the one video camera in Scotland, and it still exists. Mm. So the only moving image of Julius Eastman doing a two-hour concert of his own music is on our archive. But we didn't know what it was. We were like, this can't be Morton Feldman. And it took us about a year to discover that it was Julius Eastman and then I figured out who was Julius Eastman. Um, so now it's, because there's a whole project in New York to try and recover Julius Eastman's canon. I mean, the, yeah. the Autolith group just made a big piece about him. Huh? They did, yeah. And I think there's one Mary Jean Jane Leach in New York, and she's been collecting the bootleg cassettes she can find of people who knew him as well. And then our archive just says this out of the blue. It's beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, so the archive's full of little treasures. But it's I think it's very brave of you to just let go of things and letting other people uh, take advantage of and do their own thing. <laughs> I don't know that we have such a space here in Sweden. Do anyone else know that? There's not many around, I've been no. sent around so, the world. So, <laughs> so why, what is it that, what t does it take to get to that point, to create catastrophe. this situation? <laughs> Sorry? Sorry? Catastrophe. Catastrophe. <laughs> no, but it was already catastrophe before the yeah, fire. I was never properly educated in a, a probably educated as a medical historian um, and then weirdly my influences would be Mexico, uh, Puerto Rico, Beta Local and Ashtal Alwan in Beirut. We're all kind of like, I come from Northern Ireland, that helps. <laughs> so it feels very easy to kind of make that connection in some ways and you know it's not obvious but there's certain similarities in Ramallah, taught Ramallah in the arts. There's kind of things there that you think yeah I get this. And so I've never felt, I never felt very much part of anything. But I think all the other people working there, either Glasgow has never felt very much part of anything. It's outside, so it's easy if you're outside. And there's nothing to lose. There's plenty of other organizations. So, yeah, I've never had to have the responsibility for them because I came in when it was already kind of being shut. You know, it's like everything was already broken, so I didn't have to pay for it. <laughs> I just had to kind of glue it together and do whatever.